Good morning. My name is Stephanie Johnson, and I'm a project manager and engineer at Houston Engineering in our Maple Grove office. And I'm going to talk to you today about prioritizing non-point source management areas using LiDAR data and terrain analysis. The information that I'm going to present to you today builds upon the presentation that Zach Herman gave, which hopefully you've had an opportunity to watch, on how and why to recondition in his Hydro DEM basics presentation. I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about the linkage to the Hydro DEM and again the information that Zach discussed. And then I'm going to get more specifically into some of the water quality prioritization metrics that we're computing and how we're using that information then to develop prioritization for looking at areas in our study area to prioritize non-point source management. So the presentation that I'm going to give here and the processes that I'm talking about rely directly upon a hydrologically reconditioned DEM having been created. And if you remember the figure that Zach showed during his presentation, he talked us through the process to get to this hydrologically reconditioned DEM. And now again, I'm going to assume that that work has been done and we're then building upon it to do some different analyses to look at landscape prioritization. The inputs from the Hydro DEM that we're relying specifically upon for the work that I'm going to talk about are the hydrography, so the flow paths, the catchments, basically just indications of how water moves over the landscape. We're going to look at some of the landscape characteristics, specifically the slope, which will come directly from the Hydro DEM. Use the flow accumulation grid, the depression areas, and then also the non-contributing areas. Another point that's important to stress here is that the analyses that I'm going to talk about, they're all performed at the same scale as the Hydro DEM was created for. So in the case of the work that we're talking about here, that's the field scale, typically we're creating hydrologically reconditioned DEMs at about a three meter grid scale. Sometimes a little bit finer resolution, sometimes a little bit coarser resolution, depending on the needs of the project that we're working on. This is the process that I'm going to step us through pretty quickly here in the next few slides. So again, we take the hydrologically reconditioned DEM and we're computing two different metrics. One is the stream power index. The other is that we're using the Russell equation to do some spatial analysis. We then move into a very important step in our work, which is oftentimes done by our local partners um, with some input from us the field verification work to make sure that what we've actually done on our computer makes sense and matches up with what's being seen in the field. Once we have that work done, then we can move into developing our ranking and prioritization. So the Stream Power Index, or SPI, is basically a measure of potential energy of water as it flows over bare ground. SPI values are computed from two inputs, and so we create a raster of SPI values for our whole study area. The first input is the flow accumulation grid, or in other words, what's the drainage area that drains to each individual cell in the raster. And the second input to the SPI value is the slope of the landscape at that location. Combining these two pieces of information together, then we come up with an SPI value the idea here is that the more water that we expect to be flowing over the landscape at a certain point, which is indicated by the flow accumulation grid, will give us a higher likelihood of showing erosion, and also the higher the slope at a particular location on the landscape, we'd have a higher likelihood of experiencing er erosion. So really the SPI value, the purpose of this is to identify locations in our study area with high potential for gully erosion. I'll walk through a quick example here of where we computed SPI in one particular study that we were looking at. So in the top left figure of this slide, I've got the hydrologically reconditioned DEM as the backdrop. This was a study that was done down near the Minnesota River Valley. The Minnesota River actually runs kind of along the top part of this figure. So we've got a really flat floodplain in the top part of the figure, a steep ravine coming down then into that floodplain, and then a very flat upland area 
If this is the outlet of the watershed that we're interested in, we delineated back the catchment that feeds to that. And then you can see here in blue the flow path that runs through that catchment. The figure to the right shows the slope of the landscape in this area. So again, low slopes being blue, high slopes being red. We've got a very flat landscape in the upper part of our figure, as well as the lower part of our figure here with this bluff showing really high slopes. Moving down to the bottom left figure, this is the flow accumulation grid. High values in white, low values in black. So we can just see along the flow path that the flow accumulation increases as we would expect it to. One thing to point out in this figure is that we do actually have two flow paths coming down this bluff area. This flow path has a much higher drainage area coming to it. The values are showing up in much whiter on the figure than this other flow path coming down where we've got a little more gray. It's a defined flow path, yet it has a smaller drainage area feeding to it. Then finally, in the bottom right, we have the SPI values that were computed, a raster of those with high values shown in red and low values shown in green. Again, SPI is computed using inputs from the flow accumulation grid and the slope grid. So we can see how those values vary in the flow path across this particular subbasin. If we look at these two flow paths again coming down this bluff, it's interesting that the SPI values do reflect what we would expect. So being that both flow paths are coming down the same bluff, they've probably got about the same slope, so the same value there. However, we can see that the SPI values in the flow path to the left show up in a darker red color, showing higher values than the flow path to the right, which would make sense since the flow path to the left has a higher drainage area feeding to it, and therefore we would expect a higher likelihood of gully erosion to be occurring at that point on the landscape than in the flow path to the right. So this information is just one example of how we can prioritize areas for implementing BMPs. If you wanted to put a BMP on that bluff, for example, you'd probably want to concentrate on the flow path to the left for implementation, expecting a higher likelihood of gully erosion due simply to the drainage area that feeds to that location. The other metric that we're computing is through a use of the revised universal soil loss equation, or Russell. Russell was developed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and it's used to estimate soil erosion from fields due to raindrop impact and surface runoff. Russell is applicable for estimating erosion due to rill and interrill erosion, so essentially areas on the landscape where we're experiencing overland flow. Russell does not estimate gully erosion nor stream bank erosion, so those are important things to point out. The Russell equation is shown here in this slide and it takes into account numerous factors such as the erodibility of the soil, which is a function of what type of soil it is, the slope of the landscape, and then what's actually occurring on that landscape, what kind of crops are being grown if it's in forest. Um, you also have the option of putting in some information on if conservation measures are being implemented at a certain location. So again, I'll show some examples from one project that we were working on where we gathered up the various Russell inputs using information that's pretty readily available. We created rasters of each of the inputs to the Russell equation. So you can see the R factor in the upper left, for example, the K factor which shows the soil erodibility in the upper right. The LS factor which comes from the slope of the landscape, so that slope came directly out of our hydro DEM. And then the C factor in the bottom right that information was pulled from the cropland data layer, which is developed by the USDA. And so we looked at what kind of crop coverage, or again, if things were under grassland or forest, and we assigned C values according to that data layer. Typically, we assume that our P factor in the Russell equation is equal to one, which indicates that there's not BMPs or conservation measures being implemented on the landscape. That just gives us a conservative estimate of how much sediment could potentially be eroded. If we did have good information on conservation measures, however, that could definitely be implemented in the Russell equation. So once all this information is pulled together, again, we really 
encourage and try in each of our projects to go out and actually verify what we're seeing on the computer screen with what we see in the field. And we work really closely with our project partners to make sure that we do perform this step. In previous projects, we've, we've had very good success that our computer um, analyses are matching very well what is occurring in the field, but I definitely encourage this in the work that you're doing. For prioritization then, there are a number of different ways that you can use this data to prioritize locations on the landscape to put BMPs. So one example we showed back in the slide where I talked about the SPI values where you can just look at different flow paths and figure out where you've got high SPI values versus low SPI values and use that to guide your implementation activities. You can also average things out across a little bit more general areas on the landscape. So in this case I'm showing Russell values and SPI values averaged over uh, catchments. So in the left hand figure we have added up the overland catchment uh, sediment loads and prioritized them simply by color ramp of areas in red have high highly erodible landscapes and areas in green have less erodible landscapes due again to physical characteristics of that landscape as well as practices that are happening on that landscape. To the right then I've computed mean SPI values within each of those catchments. So again high values being red, low values being green. This gives us some indication of where the catchments are in our study area that have the most erosive flows or the most likelihood for gully erosion. And again this is the study where the Minnesota River Valley runs along kind of the upper part of the figure so we can see that most of those really red subbasins fall along this bluff or ravine as it comes down into the floodplain so that makes sense. We can also combine those scores on a catchment level and say where do we have both highly erosive flows and erodible landscapes and compute a mean score for each of those catchments ranking high values in red, low values in green. Use that to prioritize general areas for implementation. And then finally again we can take this down to really the flow path level to look at which flow paths do we want to prioritize. So it all kind of depends on the objectives of the project, what type of BMPs you're looking at implementing, and what type of issues you really want to address how we would prioritize things and how we would combine some of this data together to give you guidance on where to put things on the landscape. One other thing I wanted to mention is that the analyses that we're doing in GIS using the LiDAR data are pretty simplified. Um, they really look at just the physics of water as it moves over the landscape and use some pretty simple approaches. We can definitely, however, combine that work with other efforts that are oftentimes done in the watersheds across the state of Minnesota where we have mechanistic models for example being created of water quality processes and giving us some outputs. So an example of that is here in the Buffalo River watershed where we had some SWAT model we had a SWAT model run and we could use outputs from that SWAT model which does a more sophisticated job of modeling hydrology and water quality in the watershed we can use the SWAT model outputs to give us some indication of kind of a bigger scale yet where the most erosive landscapes are happening and where we see the highest sediment yields. In this case we've got the highest sediment yields shown in brown and then the next highest sediment yield shown in kind of this tan color. So if we take the outputs of the SWAT model and use that to identify where our priority sub basins are or maybe 12 digit hucks we can then go within those larger areas and use our LIDAR data to help take things down to the field scale. So perhaps we know for example that SWAT tells us using some sophisticated approaches that this is our one of our priority areas for implementing BMPs. We know we want to put 10 said basins in. We can go to our LIDAR analysis to start to look at where do we have high likelihood of gully erosion and start using that information on the field scale to look at where we might want to implement those said basins. So that's what I've got um, to talk about prioritizing non-point source management areas. If you've got any questions by all means please contact me. You can see my email address here listed on this slide. And thank you very much for tuning in today to listen to our presentations.